So let's go ahead and get ourselves started. Thank you all for coming today. So I'm really honored to have you here. Uh, again, I'm Glenn. I do a lot of teaching about BIM modeling and how we could go ahead and apply digital tools to help us uh, just sort of really understand our designs and illustrate our designs and hopefully communicate them to contractors and the people who have to build them. So uh, I teach in the Department of Civil Engineering at Stanford, but we support the architecture program. It's part of our civil engineering program there. But I've always been sort of in love with everything about building and how buildings actually go together. So building sciences, all the engineering behind it, but as well as the design aspects. And what I want to share with you today is really how we can go ahead and use some of the digital tools, and one that I've become very familiar with because I've been using it in my own practice for a number of years, called Revit. Okay, that's a product that Autodesk makes um, for really doing building information modeling. And more than anything, to show you how the notion of being able to model your things digitally um, could then translate into actually creating very nice views that you can share with the people who have to build them. So we can create very nice 3D details or 2D details that really explain your design intent, and that could actually be part of your actual design process. You should be able to get the model to actually help you produce those views, as opposed to having to think about drafting and uh, just creating them independently. Because you really want views and details that can just be updated with the model, so that as you go through and keep on updating your design and kind of get further and further with what you're trying to create as you understand it better, that those details keep up with you, that you don't have to kind of keep on recreating them as an afterthought. Okay, so that's really what we want to try and show you today is really just how you can sort of be successful with a tool like Revit to create these 3D models but ultimately use them to create the details you need. Okay, so that's the big overview about what's going on here. So actually, let me just start with uh, like asking you guys, because I was with one of the workshops this morning, and we're going to do another one this afternoon. How many of you have played with Revit in terms of actually getting started? Okay, a fair number. Very good. And then for the folks who have worked with Revit so far, let's get a sense about how far you are in the product. Have you, you know, placed basic like you know, walls and floors and put some windows in them, things like that? Okay, looking pretty good there. How about in terms of actually creating the details out of them, going through further? A few. Okay, excellent. Okay, hopefully this won't be like uh, too repetitive, and you'll pick up some good uh, like tips and techniques for you guys who push it a little bit further. I'm going to start relatively basic and kind of work our way up. So I'll apologize for some of you who are really familiar, but hopefully like there'll be some good like uh, kind of things you'll pick up along the way that'll like uh, make it worthwhile for everyone. And again, we're doing the workshop this afternoon that folks have signed up for. Is that like four? Four o'clock. Okay, over in two thirty-six, three twenty-six, whatever it is. <laughs> That room, which room is it? 236G. 236G, thank you very much. I'm very bad on numbers. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay, so let's go ahead and get ourselves started. I'm basically looking at a modeling environment right now, and the way I have it set up, I'm just basically have a basic drawing area where I can start going ahead and putting down different model elements. And I guess you're all creating different sort of details, some details that sort of explain how a wall assembly is going to work with the windows in it and how the floor is going to interconnect and things like that. So let me go ahead. I'm going to create something very simple that we could use as the basis for creating some details here together with you. Like when we're working in the modeling tools on the home tab of the tool, there's this notion of really just, although they're kind of off the top of the screen, <laughs> it's like, hmm. Oh, that's actually, pardon me. This is, uh, this is where the brain doesn't work. Okay, hang on, I will push this down. Like that. Sure, let me, let me shrink that down over here a little bit. Okay, we'll make this work. Okay, that's a little bit better. Hopefully you can see it all now. Okay, so in terms of what's going on here, we have an environment where we have some tools across the top. We have a basic drawing area here in the middle and different views of the model. The important thing to think about the model is that it's really all one 3D model. And although we sort of look at it in terms of floor plan views and section views and 3D views, it's really one object or one series of objects underneath it all. And that's really the beauty of building information modeling is that you model once and really all the views really become after, you know, they're outputs from the model. But anything you change anywhere in the model is going to affect all those different views. So as we get started with that, let me just go ahead and start by creating some walls. In terms of the basic walls over in the type selector, oh, there are generic walls, which a lot of people will get started with, but they only have like one material to them, so they're not very interesting. There's this whole notion of there being a lot of other wall types, and we can go ahead and customize this as needed. But if you, for example, want to have a brick wall on top of CMU as a backing, we can go ahead and choose something like that, and I can start drawing walls using one of these tools. 
As you draw walls, there's always this notion of really how high the wall should be, whether it should go up to level one, level two, or be unconnected, maybe go up to 20 feet. Let me actually do something that's probably a little bit smarter. I'm gonna to go to one of the elevation views. And right now my building is only basically two stories tall. I'm gonna go through and add another level to it just so I can actually have an intermediate floor. Okay, so now I have level three within there. I can adjust the height of that either by kind of typing in a dimension. Okay, or I can go through and actually, another way if you have to do a very big multi-story building that's kind of cool is to offset the floors. I can use this tool to go through and offset. I could put in an offset, for example, I want to have floors that are 10 feet floor to floor height. And I'll just offset and offset another and kind of very quickly go through and create some other floors. So it's really easy to create multi-level floors or multi-level buildings. And what I wanted to do in terms of creating those, just to get you started, was as I'm going through and creating the walls, unconnected 20 feet, okay, but it's not really very smart. It's really much better if I go from level one to another explicit level, because if I go to another explicit level, if the floor level changes, the wall height will change with it. So it'll kind of grow appropriately. And that's what you want to do whenever possible. So let me say, oh, I'm going to bring these up to say level three. I'll draw some walls. So far, so good. I'm not worrying about where I'm placing them too awfully much because it's really easy to go through and move them later. I can always just go through and choose things and uh, kind of move them around very nicely. Okay, now, these walls aren't very interesting so far. You're looking at them and they're two lines with sort of a white space between them. They're not showing you the detail of the wall. I actually chose a wall that had a lot of layers to it, but you don't see them right now. And this is like one of those things that you need to know, sort of know about Revit in terms of how it works. There's this notion of every, in every view of really how much detail you want to show. By default, it's showing you a coarse level of detail. That idea is that it wants to sort of speed things up and not show you all the detail in every view. But if you actually want to see the detail of, for example, all the wall layers, we could bring that up to a higher level. And then you'll see that the walls are actually made up of a series of layers. So it has like a sheetrock layer, the CMU layer, it has an insulating layer, a wall, an air layer, and finally on the outside, it has the brick on the outside. Let me even go ahead and uh, shade that so the color information may give you a little more information to go with. Okay, so I'm placing these basic walls in here. As I go through and work with the model, you'll see that if I go through and open a 3D view also, let me open just the default 3D view, it looks like that little house over there. Okay, I can go through and keep these two views open at the same time. Sometimes that's a useful thing to do. I tend to like to do this thing called tiling windows, which will show me, uh, let me get rid of the elevation so I'm not looking at that. So basically I'm looking at the 3D view as well as, scroll that on over, the view over here. In the floor plan view, you'll see if I select on a wall, it'll highlight in the 3D view same thing will happen over here. If I highlight it in the 3D view, it'll be selected in the floor plan view. And I can change these things in either, either view. I can just go ahead and move it in the floor plan view. I can move it in the 3D view. Whatever it is that I want to do, it's all one model. It's going to be interrelated. Okay, and that's going to change it in the floor plan view. And that's really the beauty of building information modeling. Now, as you go through and work with your buildings, you're probably going to go do through and put some uh, doors and windows and things like that in your facades that you're ultimately going to illustrate. So for this view, for example, let me go through and I'm just going to put in some window components. I'll just choose, oh, some of these existing ones, like these big, oh, 36 wide by 72 inch tall ones. And I'll just drop them in. And you'll notice as I'm dropping them in, okay, it's putting them into the floor plan or into the 3D view also. Okay, they're not very well spaced in terms of what's going on over there. I can move them around a little bit if I want to. Make that five feet apart. Maybe make that one five feet apart from the next one. Or even go through and copy those. Let me grab a bunch of them. And I'll just do a copy. Okay. That'll get us started in terms of what's going on. As we're working, a very nice technique you'll learn about is that when you put things on an individual level, it's very easy to copy them up to other levels. And if you think about a lot of buildings, that's just typically a very regular pattern. The windows that are on the first floor will often be very closely mirrored by some windows on the second floor that are just above. We may need to change them around a little bit, kind of adjust them, but often that's a really good starting point for getting going. 
So even doing something like this, let me go ahead and grab those windows, I'll show you kind of a, just a good Revit trick so you can sort of know about it. There's that whole thing you've been watching me kind of click on things individually, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's a really nice technique where you can drag through and grab a whole lot of things and just get a bunch all at once, which tends to make your life a little bit easier. If it turns out you've grabbed too much, okay, you can go through and filter them down and only get specific types of elements. Like I really only want to get the windows. I don't want to get the tags too. So I can filter and say, let's just get those windows. Now, what's the advantage of getting those windows? What I could do now is copy them to the clipboard and actually just paste them up to the second level. And that'll actually just make our life a little bit easier. So I can copy them to the clipboard. Then I will say paste, and I'll paste them aligned to another level. I'll just put them on level two. Okay, so we're just kind of creating a real simple little building. Okay. So that's kind of just you know, this basic idea of doing the different walls. Now, as you're doing different walls, my wall that I just put here may not look like the wall you need. And you're going to need to basically adapt a wall assembly to be close to what you need. And the big advantage of adapting the wall assemblies and making them what you need is if we get the layers right in these walls as we're modeling them, the 3D details will pop out right too. Okay, so you want to get the layers to match what you're trying to emulate with your details. So let's think about how you can do that. The idea is we have things like these walls over here. And every wall, and there's different walls here, if I want it to be just CMU insulated, I can switch to that. If I want it to be oh, an EIF system on metal studs, I can switch it to that. I can switch types pretty easily. The layers will update themselves accordingly here. But if we want to go through and start thinking about walls, for any of the different wall assemblies, we can go through and take a look at how it's made up. And that's done by let me do that again slowly. You edit the type of the wall. And when you edit the type, you can do something called editing the structure. When you edit the structure, you can actually start to see what all the different layers are. So within this wall assembly, you can start to see that it's made up of six inch metal studs, a half inch of uh, gyp board on the inside. It's got three quarters inch of wood sheathing, a two inch air layer. And then finally, some EIFS system on the outside that's three inches thick. Okay, similarly, if I go to a different type and I go back to that brick on CMU, you see it's got a layering system to it. And what you want to do is go through and make sure you have a wall assembly that matches what you're trying to build. So if you need to go ahead and adjust that at all, it's really easy to do. What you do is I'll just grab one of the existing ones and choose whatever one's closest to what you have in mind. Just choose one that's sort of similar to what you like. Let me go ahead and duplicate that. Let's talk about duplicating. The reason you want to duplicate as opposed to changing the original one is if you've already placed any elements that are using the original one, if I change its properties, it'll change all the ones that you've already placed. So think about this. As you make the change, do you want to change all of the ones that are already using this type, or do you want to create a new type that you can use? And that's like fundamentally your choice. That's going to be sort of a general Revit trick as we go through and deal with things when you create walls or doors or windows of different sizes. If you want to create a brand new type, duplicate it and change its properties versus going back and changing the original one's properties. Okay, so just a general principle for you there. Let me go ahead and change this and we'll say uh, with double jip board. So I'm creating a new type. I've given it a new name. I can edit the structure of that type. And if I want to start playing around with the structure, I can, for example, just go through and insert a layer. Let me say it's another finish layer. And I'll also go ahead and make that a material like JIP board. Okay, every layer needs some sort of thickness. So if it's going to be another 5 8 inch layer, There we have it all set. What's going to happen, I'm not sure if you sort of noticed, up here at the top, okay, the thickness adapted itself to sort of be the appropriate thickness based on all these different layers. If you want to change anything else about this, if you want the insulation to be, you're going to put in like a 6-inch or a 5-inch insulation layer. Go ahead and put that in there. Notice the dimensions are going to change up there. If you want to put a different layer layering system, I'll make four inches in there. We can sort of adjust the properties to really make the wall the way you need it to be. And you want to get that accurate right up front so that everything really about your details will sort of reflect that too. Say okay to all those things. And as I choose that, here's my new improved wall assembly. So everything's been updated 
kind of the way we want it. So don't be afraid to go ahead and change wall assemblies. It's really important. Model accurately so you get good details out of the back end. Okay, so, and if you find out halfway through that you need to sort of change that wall assembly, go ahead and change it then. Okay, but, you know, whenever you can change the underlying BIM object as opposed to just doing it through drawing, you're going to be ahead in the long run. So always go ahead and try and change it there. Now, we've just been going ahead and putting some walls in there, and that's kind of a good starting point. But let's talk about where this starts getting interesting, and that's where you start putting floors in here, and you start having your floors intersecting with your walls. Because that's where, you know, really, if you think about the interesting building connections, and really, as you start thinking about the exterior surface, the connections that everyone loves to know about are really, how does that wall connect to the foundation? How do the intermediate floors connect into that wall? Okay, how does the roof connect to that wall? And then often we do something specifically around the windows and how all the, the window articulation and all the flashing details and the sills, how they connect to the wall. Those are like your big four. If you cover those four things, you can describe most any wall kind of pretty quickly. So those are the ones you really want to sort of focus on. So let's go ahead and we're going to do the floor to wall one. because That's kind of a good one. That kind of illustrates a lot of different pieces. The idea is I got my wall kind of hanging around in here. I'm just going to sort of expand that to make it a little bit bigger. I want to put a floor in here, so let's talk about this. When you go through and put in floors or roofs or walls or anything that you want to put in there, the issue of which plan you put it on is actually important because by default, the level you choose when you place it will be the level where that object is assumed to be. So if you want to put a floor at level two, go to the level two floor plan. If you want to put a floor at level three, go to the level three floor plan. Okay. Now, you can always change it later. Don't worry about that. If you need to, any object can be moved from floor to floor. And often when we're putting things in, we sort of get sloppy and put them at the wrong level. So don't worry. Don't panic. You can always fix it. But if you want to make your life easier, let me just go to level two. And I'll put the floor in at that level. You'll notice here on level two, well, I don't, I don't look at all my layers. What happened to all my layers? Don't worry. They didn't go away. It's just that every layer, every view is independent. Okay, so I have to turn on the layering for that view too. Okay, so don't worry. You're never losing things. There may be times when you can't see it, but you never lose things. They're just sometimes not visible to you. Okay, let's go ahead. We'll put a floor in here. For the floors, again, we have the whole issue of what is the type of floor. And there's a lot of good types in here. There's wood floors that have a wooden finish, wood floors that have a carpet finish. These are all sort of made up of multiple layers. There's a particularly interesting one, the lightweight concrete floor on top of a metal deck. I'm going to go ahead and put that one in there because that's actually probably one of the most interesting ones in terms of working with it. But if I wanted to, I will switch to that in just a second. Let me do something real basic, which is I will just go ahead and put the wood floor in first. Then we'll switch it. I changed my mind halfway through the sentence. That's pretty good. Okay, so we'll go through and like uh, change it to the wood floor or the wood finish. Let's talk about this. Okay, here's the deal. I'm going to put a floor in my building. Okay. And as you put your floor in your building, we're going to go through sketching the boundary. Now, when you're sketching, you can go ahead and draw lines. Okay, and just kind of sketch and do all that. And that works. Okay, it's not the most powerful way. Let me show you a better way to do it, but you can go ahead and always just sketch lines. Kind of in the same sense that it made sense to sort of lock the wall to level two or level three and have a locked parametric relationship. Okay. It's nice to have a relationship between your floors and your walls where if you say the floor really goes up to a specific line of the wall, the nice thing is if the wall moves, the floor will move with it or the floor will expand with it. And you really like that because then as you go through and change your design, things kind of adapt smartly. So the way to make that happen is to choose not one of these line drawing tools, but choose this tool over here called picking walls. And when you choose that tool, you get this sort of issue over here of, I can pick a wall. Okay, and it actually chose a very specific point right there. What it shows right there, because I have extend into the wall to the core selected, is it's choosing what it considers to be the boundary of the structural layers. So for this wall, that's the boundary of where the concrete block is stopping. Okay, if it was a stud wall, it might be the outside of the wood face of the studs or the outside of the metal face of the studs. If it's a generic wall, it'll probably just be the outside surface. Okay, so it's always good to go ahead and pick that way. Let me kind of pick the other walls and kind of show you why that's kind of a good choice. Okay, I just pick those four different walls. Actually, let me do this. I, I, for, for all my Revit experts in the audience, I'll, I always like to give you sort of like shortcuts too. 
take them out. I'm just undoing. Okay. If you're a pro and that all seemed really boring to you, go ahead and pick walls, hover over one of the walls, and if you tab, it'll grab all the walls. I'm not sure if you can see that. If I hover and then I tab, they're all going to turn slightly blue. You can click once and get them all. Of course, it did a very bad job of picking which side of the core. I might need to flip it. Okay, now it's over to the, the outside face of the core, the inside face of the core. Okay, but just little shortcuts to kind of give you along the way. But I've basically chosen the wall. What I'm going to do is say, let us finish the floor. Okay, a very important question comes up, and it's actually one of the more confusing questions that you sort of run into with Revit, but the answer to this is almost always yes. Here, here's what the deal is. When you go ahead and you have your walls going all the way up from floor one all the way up to floor three and you have the floor coming in and intersecting, there's actually this little part where the floor is intersecting. It's poking itself into the wall. And the question is here really, where they do overlap, would you like to cut out the volume? Okay. And the answer is typically yes, please do. Go ahead and cut out that part of the wall. My wall quantities will be accurate. When I do the details, it'll show accurately. It'll layer nicely if you do that. But let me kind of show you what the difference is. If I say no, okay, everything seems to be okay. But when we go through and we draw a section view, which is going to be the beginning of our details, if I draw the section through here and say okay, let's look, take a look at that. Now, once again, I have something that looks pretty boring. It's not showing me very much because it's at a coarse level of detail. But let me turn up the level of detail and you can kind of see what's going on. Okay, so this is not too bad, but here's the little kind of area that I want you to pay attention to right there. Okay, that's what happens when your walls and your floors are overlapping. Okay, and we could go ahead and clean that up using some line work, but we can actually fix that right in the model and it's better to fix it right in the model because then it'll be very smart about adapting. So here's the deal, I really don't want those joists to go through and kind of have the wall kind of poking right through them. There really will be some sort of relationship where whatever's happening with the floor is resting on top of that wall. So what I need to do is as follows. I'm going to go back and edit the boundary of that floor. I'm only editing the boundary because it's, I just need to make some change to the floor in order to get it to ask the question again. In fact, I might be able to do it. What happens if I just do that? Yep. All I had to do was just sort of edit it and reclose it again. What I had to do is basically get it to sort of say complete the floor again, and it'll go through and ask the question. This time I'm going to say, should I cut that out? And I'll say yes instead. Please do. Okay, and when we go now to the section, that's happening. Okay, and that's really a whole lot better. In fact, that's a little hard to see just because the lines are all thick. Let me go ahead and uh, thin out the lines for you. You see what's going on there? We actually have... It's actually doing a pretty smart job. If that's the wood joist layer, it's on top of blocks. That's kind of a little of a structural problem here. But if these were wood frame walls, the joists are coming across, the subfloor is coming across. Notice way back up in here, this is actually quite sophisticated. Okay, the subfloor is coming under the bottom of the wall, the finished floor is staying to the inside, and the sheetrock's actually coming down on top of the finished floor. And that's actually pretty darn good in terms of accurately how it's going to be built. So it tries to be very smart. There's a whole notion of the priority of different materials and how they layer. But this is really pretty far along to add actual construction detail. We'll show you in a couple of minutes how you sort of adapt that and add the final pieces. But if you get the modeling down right, the construction detail is like three quarters done for you. Okay, and that's the point we want you to kind of leave with all this, is if you get the modeling right, you'll be in pretty good shape. Now, just to sort of change, to give you a sense of why this is sort of a good way to do it, if, I, for example, I change that to a generic 12-inch floor, which much might be like a 12-inch concrete slab or something like that, notice that it's still intersected properly and kind of the details cleaning itself up nicely. If I go back and change that floor to be, oh, more the lightweight concrete and deck, okay, again, it did a fairly accurate job about what's going on here. We need to put some structure in and sort of mess around with this a little bit. But the detail's kind of taking care of itself, and that's what we want to have happen. Okay, so far so good? Excellent. Okay. Now for floor types, let's talk about this. Floor types have a funny little attribute to them, and that's this notion of floors just aren't, unless you're concrete, they tend to have like joists and beams and things supporting them, and you, you have to kind of worry. They actually have a directionality to them. 
Okay, so here's how that works. You will notice in this building, okay, I cut a building, a section that's going from left to right. You can sort of see all the little ridges in the steel deck that are supporting the floor. That's looking pretty good. Let me go through and cut a section in the other direction for you. So I'll cut this section. And again, I'll zoom on up. Okay, looks a little different. And that is because from this angle, looking from the other side, okay, we're not gonna see the ends of the waffly deck. You're only gonna see the kind of side view of it. We're gonna see the straight lines coming across. So these metal deck floors actually have this funny directionality to them. Turns out like joist floors do too. A lot of things have a directionality to them. And if you want to go through and be accurate about that, okay, because, you know, the joists run in one direction and not another, and you want to be able to illustrate both sides, here's how we control that. If I take that floor and I'll edit its boundary again, let's go back to level two so I can sort of see the sketch. One pair of lines that we didn't pay much attention to the first time is right over here. And those parallel lines are indicating what direction the joists are running, or in this case, what direction the metal pan is running. Okay, the little ridges in the pan. And what tends to happen is it'll be the first line you click. The first wall you click will be the one that it sort of assumes the direction is going in. Now, if you want to fix that, no worries. It's easy to do. We, over in the drawing tools, have a tool right over here where we can change the direction. And I can just choose another direction. And instead, it'll flip it over to go left, right, as opposed to going north, south. Okay, so that's just you know, subtle stuff. It does make a difference so when you're actually doing the fine grained detailing about there's the direction where everything runs in and there's the direction where everything kind of runs parallel or runs perpendicular. But you can always go through and change that. The net effect is now this view, which used to be the one that we're looking the end on view, now is looking at the side view. The other one will be the end view instead. Okay. Change over there. There's the end view, kind of showing those things. So, so far so good. We're actually looking pretty good about what's happening in here. Okay, we do need to add some more stuff in here though to really kind of build this section up. One thing we'd probably want to add is some structural elements. Okay, because it's not enough just to go ahead and have this deck. This deck's not gonna expand and expand 20 feet all by itself. You need to sort of get some structure under here going through and supporting that. And let's show you how you do that. Because it's actually, it's pretty easy. It's just another building type. But structure has one kind of funny attribute you have to know about or one thing about working with it. It works as an object very similar to other things. The hard part about placing structure is, and this is what's weird, yeah, as opposed to most things you place which are sort of below you, okay, structure is often above your head. Okay, so you just have to sort of be careful about how you place it because it's real easy to get to the situation where you're placing it and it keeps on giving you a message. Rev will give you, oh, you can't see those objects in your view. Okay, it doesn't mean the object hasn't been created. It just means you're placing objects that you can't see. Okay, which sounds kind of weird, but it's actually, it's giving you a truthful message. It just doesn't seem very, very helpful. What it is is you're looking down and the things are going in above your head and you need to switch your view to be able to see them. Okay, so let's show you how that actually works. So here's the deal. I am hanging around in here. I got my building floating around. Actually, you know, we've been sort of playing around with this in like a 2D. Let me just kind of show it to you in 3D too. Just so I want to do that first so you sort of get a sense of how this all works in all dimensions. Let me go back to that default 3D view. Okay, this is kind of where we're looking at. Okay, so far, you know, it's kind of okay. It's not very interesting in terms of showing the structure and what's going on here. You say, hey, you know, I like 3D views and I like sections be awfully nice if I could kind of get those two things together. Okay, so let's show you how you do that. I got my 3D view. Every 3D view, every view really, has this property called a section box. Let's show you what that thing does. If you turn on the section box, okay, you can't see much there. There it is. Okay, it's, think of it as a big shoe box that's going all around that is really made of a bunch of section planes. So if you click on it, and you go pushing on in, okay, you start to actually get the little 3D sections. Okay, now, 
This, you might start recognizing as looking, oh, this is kind of similar to what Andres asked me to produce for the assignment. Okay, so uh, keep track of this thing because this thing's going to come in very useful to you. Okay, section box is a very good thing. In fact, section box not only works in these axonometric views, and a lot of times we do axonometric views, it's become very, very popular now. Not only do we do our axons, we're getting to this whole thing where we start doing exploded perspective views and cuts perspective views. Let's kind of show you that just so you get a sense of how that works too. Because it's the same basic principle. I'll go back to a floor plan view. Okay, for my real folks, you know, people have created perspective views. It's actually, it's a real simple thing if you haven't done it yet. There's the default 3D view and it's kind of good for what it wants to be. There's a camera tool that lets you go ahead and make perspective views and how it works is you take a camera, you place it down in the drawing somewhere. This is going to be where you'd be standing with the camera and you just pull out to the direction that you want to see. Okay, and that far point I'm pulling is the target. Okay, and that is my perspective view. Okay, not very interesting yet. Kind of okay. Let me go ahead and I'll shade that. Now, in the same sense, you got a perspective view, that's looking pretty good. I got a section view, can I get those two things together? And the answer is, you might suspect, or I wouldn't be telling you this. There it is, yes. There's a section box. Now, how do you use the section box here? There's a couple different ways you can do it. You can grab it right here, although it's a little hard to manipulate here. Like for right now, I'm not exactly sure which one of those are, am I controlling the back plane or the front plane? I'm guessing that's the front. Now it's actually the back. I can see I'm moving it there. Let me control the front plane here and move it on back there. But let me show you a better way to do that because the cool thing is the section box, like any other element, could be controlled in many views. So watch this. If you grab the section box, okay, and I'm looking at it in my 3D view here, if I go back to my 2D view, it'll still be highlighted there. So I can go through and control it over here and adjust its boundaries. Oops, I moved the wall that time, as opposed to the section box. I don't see the section box now. I'll have to go back to the 3D view to select it. There it is. And I can start adjusting it there. So in the same sense that I had that nice axonometric view, I got this 3D perspective view that's starting to look like the details. So this is looking pretty good too, in terms of what you want. It just kind of depends whether you like axon and perspective. Yes? You most certainly may. You can go ahead and say things, or can. You may too, but you can. <laughs> I'll go through and say uh, render. I can say, uh, I'll even kind of ratchet it up a little bit just because, and that's a pretty quick machine. So if you've done a good job of assigning materials, yeah, that was, that's, that's pretty grainy looking. <laughs> Okay, we can decide on the materials qualities, we can decide on the amount of sun, kind of adjust things in terms of how finely the detail that is, but you start to see, you know, it's, it's getting pretty good in here in terms of showing the different layers and what's going on. So yes, after you go through and create these basic 3D views, if you've assigned materials and work with the lighting, you can do renderings right in here. If you really want just, you know, primo renderings, we can take them to 3DS Max and really, map, yeah, but get quickie ones right here in Revit. Yes. Ah, a call out, and we're going to sort of play with that in just a second, is really a way of getting a very small, a smaller section. A call out's really just a blow up of an area of interest. So, so hold that thought, because we're going to need it in about three minutes. Five. Okay, but we're going to get to that. Yes? Is there a way to move the camera once you place it? Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay, you can do that a couple different ways. So here I am, I got my camera view in here. I can either go through and from this view, and watch this, if I go to the level one view, I choose this view, I can say show the camera, and I can sort of see it there. So that'll expose the camera where it is in a floor plan view. But let me show you an easier way, because this is actually, a lot of cool things have been introduced in the last couple of years that are really kind of nice. There's this little thing over here called the steering wheel, where is if you go to the full navigation wheel, that's gonna be the one that has the most control, I can do this. I can 
walk backwards. I can walk forwards. Or I can look to the left or look to the right. So you get a lot of control over that later on if you just want to sort of be up or down, like panning up or down. This is the whole issue. If you think about you know, me relative to you, you know, walking is me moving back and forth. Looking is I'm staying in the same place, but I'm just rotating my head around and deciding what I want to look at. Up and down is I'm still staying in the same place, but I'm doing this. Yeah, you know, it's like panning is I'm doing this. Yeah, you know, there's like all these sort of it's like dollying around with a camera. Okay, but you have a lot of control over that. So after you get the camera in place, I'd say the best thing to do is go through and yeah, try to adjust it here to kind of really create the view you want. Okay, so a lot of ability to go ahead and take an accurate model and start to create kind of useful views. Let's do, we're gonna go just a little further. Let me add some structure in this so I can see that. Then we'll use the callout box to go ahead and really say, let's start creating a detail, something that looks more like a construction quality detail that explains it. Okay, then we'll even show you how to make a 3D detail. Okay, so that's our path for the next little thing. But we will get back to this eye candy because this is actually really, really very, very cool. And I should say, it's more than just eye candy. This whole notion of really being able to explain things in 3D, you're going to find out is really one of the most effective ways of really communicating to people what you really want to have happening. Because 2D details, what we're really about learning here is that uh, there's a level of abstraction and... Yeah, just kind of remoteness that is, makes it very, very hard. For, some people have a very hard time interpreting 2D details. Whereas if you make things in 3D, for a lot of people, they become very real. Okay, so there's real value in doing that. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's add that structure in so we have even better looking views. So here's the deal. You can even sort of see here, I got my floor deck. It's kind of doing its thing. Uh, it's lightweight metal deck. We need some sort of like a structural system that's going to go ahead and support this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to level two. Actually, I take that. I'm going to go to level one and look up at level two. Okay, slight difference there. Okay, so level one, instead of being here four feet looking down, I'm here looking up. Okay, so when it's time to go through and put in the structure, I do something like this. I'm going to go through and I have beams, I have columns, floor systems, trusses. I'm going to go to the beam tool. And for my beam tool, let me go ahead and grab some beams. For example, we have some nice steel flange beams, some wide flange beams. We could sort of place that one or place some more. Let me place that one first, then I'll show you how to get some more beams and throw them in here too. So I'll start by just choosing that one. There's the notion of a placement plane. Let's talk about that. Okay, I'm looking up at level two, but if I place the beam at level one, it again is gonna be behind me. I wanna place it at level two. That make sense? It's kind of weird. So the placement plane is which level it's going to be associated with. So I'm going to place it on level two. At this point, I can just start drawing it. And let me go ahead and draw one across this way. Notice I got one of those nasty messages. None of the created elements are visible in the reflected ceiling plan view. You may want to check the view, check its visibility settings, all these different things. Okay. We have created the beam, you just can't see it now. So let's talk about how you go back and find it. The truth is actually, since we've been sort of good and we've been creating 3D views, you can see it is there. In fact, there it is there too. Okay, we just don't see it in our view and let's talk about why. By default in Revit architecture, a lot of the structural elements are hidden from you. That's just it. The idea is that for architects, they figured, oh, you wouldn't want to be looking at all those structural elements all the time, which is probably a pretty bad assumption. So we just need to sort of make them visible. And how we do that is under the View tab, there's something called Visibility Graphics. And if we scroll on down, one of the categories of elements, Structural Framing, which is where all the beams are classified as, is just invisible right now. So we can turn that on, okay, and all of a sudden now it's visible. Now, it's visible, but you'll notice, oh, it's kind of a wimpy looking beam. That's just kind of a single line, okay? Structural engineers tend not to like to have their drawings cluttered up with all the different sort of widths and depths and the full size of the beam. They tend to show things just as single line representations of where the framing elements are gonna go. If you actually wanna see more detail, go ahead and ratchet it up. 
to like medium or full, then you'll start to see that. Okay, so now we can start to see that. Now, that beam, we're in pretty good shape, but actually if I go to that 3D view or the section view, you'll see we're not quite in good shape. Let me go to the section view. We'll see, take a look at it over there. Which one is it? I think it's that one. There we go. Okay, people who know about how buildings are constructed, what's wrong with this detail? Yeah, we can't have that. That's not good at all. So before I go putting a bunch of these all over the building, let me fix the height of it so that it's actually at the right height. By default, beams just show up right at the level two level. Okay, if I want to change that, I'm going to choose that. And I'm going to give it a, something called a Z direction, kind of the up-down direction, give it an offset. So as opposed to being right at the top, where the top of the beam right, is right at level two, I'm going to give it a little bit of an offset. I'm going to say, make it other. I'm going to drop it down five inches, so minus five inches. And I just happen to know that's the size of this uh, metal decking. Okay, and that's a little bit better. Okay, so far so good? So watch out for that in terms of beams. When you go through, let's think about it, because it's different for different types of systems. Steel, beams under the metal decking, put it below the decking. Concrete, turns out it doesn't matter. Concrete beams can be right at the floor level because they will merge nicely with the floor slab. We often don't offset those. Wood, we tend to actually, you put it down just a little bit, it's going to be just below the subfloor, but the beams tend to actually be within the, the sandwich, the joists to be right within the sandwich. So every kind of system has its own kind of slightly different qualities. But now that that's showing up properly in the section view, if you go on back over here, you'll see that it's showing up properly in the 3D views too. And what we can do is now start kind of copying this more as a joist system. So a couple of different things we might want to do. Let me take this little guy, and if I want to copy one of these, I can just choose copy and kind of pull it on over some distance. I can copy and pull it on over a distance. But you're going to figure out pretty quickly that if you need to copy a bunch of them, and it turns out when you're doing beams, you tend to kind of copy them at a very regular spacing and put it a bunch of them. There's another tool that's even better for you, and that's called the Array tool. And all Array does, think of copy, but think of copying multiple copies at a specific distance. So that's what you're really going to get into. So let's choose that guy. And as opposed to just going through and doing the copy, I'm going to say Array. And Array lets me go through and put in some number. I'll put in like 10 of them. I will put in some offset. Okay, and it will put a bunch of them in there. Hmm, maybe a few too many of them. <laughs> At which point I can go back and choose the array. Let's see if I can get to it. Nah. They're there. You. There. <laughs> Don't fight me. There we go. I'll put in oh, six of them or something like that. Maybe that's better in terms of what's going on. You could also, when you array things, if it turns out you just want a different distance, I can go through and grab and kind of do what it wants. Okay, so arraying is pretty good because then I start having something that looks a little bit more, look like what I want across the entire building. Yes? Sure. And what we would do then is, let's go ahead and we're going to do a move. This would be a good example of where I might do a big drag to grab a bunch of things. I'm going to filter because I only want to go through and like, uh, I don't want to get the framing tags. I don't want to get the view markers. I just want to get those arrayed objects. And then I can move and then it'll, it'll pan them all down evenly. Okay, now. Another really good system that you need to know about is something called a beam system. Okay, and just so you can sort of see what that one's like, just to kind of complete your idea of structure. These are beams. These are the main beams. You can think about the girders or kind of the big elements. Okay, often between these we'll have smaller elements called joists or something that sort of span between them. And if you want to do something like that, there's another tool called the beam system tool, which is so, so similar. Okay, the beam system, if you like beams and you like to ring, 
Okay, if you got beams and a raying together and they had a child, okay, it'd be a beam system. And that's what's going on here. Okay, so the way a beam system works is we choose a boundary. And again, I can choose some beams to put them on. Okay, let me go through and kind of just click some edges on the sides. I can click walls, that's fine. I'll say it's going to go from here. Actually, I can't do that. Okay. What I'm going to do is do a little trimming. I have to clean up my boundary. If you've worked at all with Revit in terms of this notion of how you draw bounded areas, you have to kind of make continuous loops. That's what I'm doing here. Okay. This is a case where you see those parallel lines. They're running the same direction as the beams. I actually don't want my joists to run in that direction. I want them to run in the other direction, be perpendicular. So what I'm going to do instead is change the beam direction to this direction. Okay. And now I'll say, okay. And we got a bunch of those. Now these, currently they're all set up to be, I have to give them a Z direction offset. Let me go ahead and do that. That is the minus five inches. Actually, let me do it for the whole system. Hang on. I don't just want to do that single one. I want to get the whole bunch. I am trying and it's not cooperating. Hmm. Let me try doing it this way. That should be okay there, but I'm not quite liking that. Oh, you know what it is? It's because I'm not in Revit structure. I'm in Revit, okay. There's different versions of the program, Revit structure versus Revit architecture. In the structure, I can change those all really quickly as one. Here, I have a little less control over changing those. That's interesting. Let me back up and I'll do it over here. In terms of the system, I can basically choose whatever the distance is here. For example, oh, I'll put them every uh, four feet or something like that. I can also choose the type of thing that I want to have happen between. And if I don't, for example, want to have these wide flange beams, let me go through and choose a different type. Okay, oh, what do I want to do there? Hey, cancel that. Let me go ahead and load in something first. If in the other direction I want to bring in, in fact, this is going to be generally true for people who have wooden structures or have some other type of structure. We can bring in framing systems. I could bring in wooden elements like dimensional lumber or a glue lamb beams. So for example, if you have a wood floor that you're trying to model, you can bring in dimensional lumber and bring in, oh, I'm going to bring in a bunch of like uh, the four by elements. And I'll bring in the two by elements. Okay, I'm also going to go ahead and bring in something else. We'll go ahead and bring in some like open web joists too, just so we have those available to us. Steel. I'll go where they go. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, there they are. And I'll bring in some of those. Okay, the nice thing now is when we go through and create something like a beam system, again, let me do this. I'm going to give it the elevation up front of minus five inches because I want to sort of lower it a little bit. I'll go through and do the picking. I'll do the sides. Trim them up though I wanted to. It's a little messy on that one side. Da, 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 over here. Okay, now I'm going to do the trimming. I'll get out of this hole in just a second and get back to on track. Sometimes in demos you go down rat holes that just sort of take much longer than you want them to. This is one of those. <laughs> It's the simple demo that got hard. Okay, uh, again, we'll change the boundary, the beam direction on that. Okay, in terms of the what I want to run in the other direction, the, what I was trying to show you is that basically we can choose a different type of element. For example, those rods there, give a spacing of say every four feet. 
finish that up. Okay, what good was all that? Let's go back over to 3D and kind of take a look. We now have something that looks, if I pan it in place, more like that, which starts actually looking like a real structure. And the nice thing about things like this is if you've gone through and created things like that, again, remember my whole thing about copying and pasting to paste it between levels? Okay, we can do the same thing here. Let me filter that and just get the beam systems. I get the joists too. And I can go through and copy and paste those around a little bit too. Okay, the good news is if you go through and do something like this and you have a multi-story structure, you can do this from level one to level two to level three and you can really start creating your entire structure very quickly. So again, let's come back over here. Just kind of illustrate all that. Let me grab all those. Let me get the uh, structural framing. I'll leave the tags out. That looks pretty good. I will copy that. I'm going to paste it just up to uh, level three. Okay, and what do we have now? What do we have now? Ah, thank you. <laughs> There's all these, yeah, I'd sit here and fumble for a while, but you guys know, well, they're a little high flying right now. I'll think about that. It has to do with whether they're at level one or level two. It looks like I guessed wrong in terms of the direction, in terms of what they need to be. So let me undo that. Let me go back and I'll say, uh, oops, undo that. I'll bring that section box up again. Modify, we'll paste aligned, bring them to section two. There they are. We start building a structure. Oops, I missed the beams. But you can start building your structure pretty nicely. So in any case, the deal is go ahead and put your structure elements in there too. Put them in the model. Why? Because now your details will start having those too. So finally, let's talk detail, which is sort of why we came here in the first place. Okay, and let's do, yeah. It took me a lot longer than five minutes to get to where I was going, but hopefully it'll be worthwhile. You have been creating these fabulous building sections, and building sections are so, so nice. We like building sections because really at a high level, it explains what's going on as the overall structure system sort of supports the building. You need building sections just to kind of give people the high level view of how the whole thing fits together. But it's very nice to have little detailed views that actually sort of like uh, really start to look at, for example, oh, what this little connection looks like. And how you deal with that I'm going to go ahead and move my section view so it actually cuts through a window so you can sort of see that too. Do I have any windows in this? Where are my windows? Oh, I'm in the ceiling plan so I can't see my windows. There we go. So I got something. I got a window. I got like some piece of wall. I got the floor intersecting with that. What I would really like to do is actually go through now and actually create more of a section or a little detail that really kind of focuses in on that. And how we do that is to use the callout. The idea of the callout is, as opposed to doing a completely new draft of this where we go through and put a lot of lines in there, what I'd really like to do is just kind of focus in on a specific area. So for example, I just want to focus in on that area right there. Okay, and that's a callout. Now, what does a callout actually do for us? Let me move that around. That's the head of the callout. If I go through and either click on the head, or I could actually, it's over here in the browser too. It's the callout there. We get to this view. It looks kind of plain right now because, again, we just need to show more detail. And maybe I'll want to blow that up to a higher scale, like inch equals a foot or something like that. Okay. You can actually start thinking about just how all these different sort of pieces fit together. And in terms of these different pieces fitting together, okay, there's a couple of different things we may want to do. One is, in a detailed view, okay, we can do things like add annotations. We can put in dimensions, we can put in callouts, we can put in anything that it is that will help explain the drawing. So a very common thing, actually let me even kind of explain what's going on here in the screen. This is just a crop boundary, so if you want to see more or less, you can sort of move that around. 
Okay? This outer box over there, that's called the annotation crop boundary. Now let me show you what it's good for. That is, as you go through and put in annotations, and they're all under the annotate tab, which are really just pieces of uh, information that'll live in this view only. If I choose, for example, text annotations, and I say that, oh, this is going to be the window frame. Okay, watch this. If that annotation lives within the annotation crop, okay, it's going to be fine. You're going to see it. If you have annotations and this happens to you, okay, the annotation didn't go away. It's just being cropped out of your view because it's sort of further outside the range. What you can do is expand the annotation crop and it'll show back up again. Shrink it, it'll go away. So watch out for that one as you're creating details. That's one of those things that I get myself in trouble on is as I put in the annotations, if they're disappearing, it's generally that they're just kind of popping outside the crop. Okay, so I can put in little text messages. That's kind of okay. More common though, I'll go through and put in things like dimensions. I'll say that the dimension from here to here is whatever that head height there, or the sill height there. I can put in some dimension up to the sill or the head of that one. Let me go back in there and do that again. Put some sort of dimension in here. The nice thing is these uh, dimensions are associative in that if I go through and move the window, if I move it in this detail view, if I move it in the elevation view, if I move it in any view, what's going to happen is the dimension will annotate or even the dimension can drive the geometry. So for example, if I go through here and put in there that I want that to be two feet up as opposed to one foot, okay, I've actually just moved that in the 3D model. So all my elevations, all my sections, everything's kind of completely interlinked. Okay, so dimensions can actually drive geometry too. Okay, same sort of thing if I decide that I want a different type of window in here. As opposed to this fixed window, if I want to go through and kind of change its type, let me even sort of load in a different type of window. I'll go to put in a double hung window only because that'll look different. It's not a very good choice for a commercial building or whatever this building might be. But if I go through and choose that now and I change that to a double hung window, that doesn't look very different. Well, actually, it does a little bit. It's down in there is where the difference is happening. Or even if I change the properties there in terms of, oh, you know, how this window is defined in terms of the window inset. If that, it's a very deep wall. If I want that to be inset a little bit and I change the properties there. Okay. We can go ahead, change it in the 3D model, but I hope what you're seeing is that my details keeping up with me. As I change my model, my construction details keeping up with me, I'm not actually having to do a whole lot of new drafting to make this happen. Now, as you add things in here, the big things to add are either uh, text, dimensions. Those are kind of good things to add in there. Another thing you can add that's kind of good are you can put in callouts. For example, if I go through and I know that's a specific window, it has a mark associated with it, I can go through and tag that window. It's kind of very small in scale. That'll actually now go back and say that is window 18. And what is that window 18? That's window 18 as it appears in the window schedule. So the mark is kind of all corroborate or collaborate, corroborated, coordinated between those different things. So go ahead and when you can, as opposed to putting text, go ahead and put in marks. That's actually our callouts. That way you're really pulling information out of the database as opposed to putting text in there. The nice thing about doing stuff like that is if that changes to a different type of window again, okay, the mark's going to change. And the nice thing about having it change in the detail then is, again, I make any change, the call out in the detail is going to refer to the right type of window as opposed to the wrong type. So whenever you can, pull things out of the database. Okay. Other interesting things or good things to do is this whole notion of, do you ever talk about like keynoting? as opposed to putting text in there? Sure. Sure. Anyway, it's just sort of another way of doing annotations. So let's just kind of show you that. And it's this notion that, as opposed to putting in just static pieces of text, there's this notion that a lot of times we go through and we put keynotes. And keynotes are really just a database of different notations that we've all agreed on as standard notations for describing different things. 
And across a large set of documents, if you have a hundred sheets with all these different views in them and you want to refer to that wall in a specific way, it's better to sort of pull a standard notation out as opposed to like, a, like a making up individual notations along the way. So I can add things like keynotes. Keynotes then pull back to, for example, oh, what is this? This is probably thermal and moisture protection. What is this? It's probably some sort of wall assembly. I'd have to find it in here in terms of what's going on. Uh, I'll just pull out a call, a call out in here. That's not actually what it is. But the nice thing about going through and doing that is that is now referencing that material. It's actually a window. <laughs> it's referencing that material back to a specific section that could then be back in the specification. So you have kind of, again, complete coordination between all your documents. So whenever you can, it's better to go ahead and keynote as opposed to just putting text in because it does well for you that way. Now, so far we're doing pretty good. We got these things that look pretty good. The, some of the things that are missing, though, that you may be noticing are as much as I think this is a pretty good construction detail, it doesn't really have everything you might want to have in there. For example, I got that, it's a block wall now, make more sense if it was a stud wall, but if I wanted to go through and have, oh, some sort of a base plate on this wall or some sort of an anchor bolt or maybe some hot plates on this wall, just something that's going to help us interconnect between those different things. You get to this very funny issue, and this is really something that's been changing over the last couple of years, where it used to be we'd model the big elements, but we really wouldn't model every last bolt, every last screw, every last small detail. We're doing more and more modeling the detail now because we have better ways of doing it. But the way you do this at the highest level is we say, you know, we'll let the model be good for the big things. But for this detail, rather than putting in every last base plate and every last bolt in the whole building, we'll do it in a, a typical wall section or a typical wall detail. And we'll draw some things in there to complement the modeling. And again, the point here is that's changing over time. but we often start by just drawing things in. So don't be afraid. Just because you're modeling most things in 3D doesn't mean every last element has to be done in 3D. We still do a little bit of 2D drafting to kind of complete our details. So to do that, you do this. We'll say, hey, let's go to annotate. We can always just put lines in. So I can just draw lines on top of this and make whatever I want to have happen there. So I got some wall, and it's got some line. And I'll go through and kind of put something over here to indicate some sort of blocking. And that'd be OK. That's not a very great way to do it. Just drawing lines in is kind of, it's really your last resort. When all else fails, put lines in. OK. But let me show you something I think is a little bit stronger. And that is this notion of something called a detail component. Let's kind of show you what they look like. Detail components, it's kind of, again, a hybrid. It's the notion that somewhere between individual lines and things which are real 3D objects, we can go ahead and have line objects that are actually pretty smart about their uh, properties and how they all work. So how this works is if, for example, I load up detail components. Oh, let me go ahead and find like wood framing. Actually, I take that back. Let me go ahead and find metals. That's fastenings. Cold form, metal joist framing, C joist section. That'll do it. Okay. If I want to do something like this, okay, and I want to put some sort of indication of the joists that are going to go inside that wall, I can tab and rotate it around, but I can start to actually sort of place elements in the wall, which are really, I'll call them detail elements. They're things where we're completing the wall. Okay, but we're not actually going through and modeling it and just sort of put that into the detail. That one's actually not very well aligned. Let me do an align. Align. I'll pop that over and put it in there and lock it in place. Okay, there's other ones that are, you know, very common ones and we can play around with like a zillion things that you could bring in this way. Um, if I go to detail components under wood and plastic where I was going, if any of you were doing sort of wood framing, like all this whole notion of the nom nominal cut lumber, Although we can put in the real beams, there's this whole notion here of if you really want to put in there some like oh, a 6 by 6 or something like that, we'll bring it in. And that is actually how we typically draw a 6 by 6 when we're doing it as a construction detail, something like that. 
So you can go ahead and put that in wherever it needs to be. You know, maybe at the, uh, oh, what'll typically happen at the base of like a window or something like that, we'll have some sort of special framing that's gonna support the bottom of the window frame, something like that at the sill where it's all joined in there. Okay, other good ones to sort of know about are things like, oh, I love this one. Let's bring in anchor bolts. Anchor bolts are one of my favorite things only because they're kind of hard to draw. But they're sort of a good example. This won't make any sense in terms of being up here at this level. It would really be down there at the bottom where we're joining the uh, concrete floor. But I can go through and put in an anchor bolt. And this is an example where these things get to be a little bit smart. It has parameters to it. For example, I can make that 20 inches long. Okay. And it'll sort of draw itself for me and hopefully look about right in terms of what's going on. So think about not only do you have true 3D parametric objects, you also have 2D parametric drafting gates. And you'll use those sometimes in terms of trying to make things happen, like uh, just trying to draw them in here. Now, this whole idea of going through and doing these 2D details in terms of doing that is pretty good. And this is really the way a lot of us have been doing it for years and years. We've been doing these 2D details. But more and more now, we're trying to get into the notion of the 3D and how you actually sort of model things accurately there. So let me just kind of show you a couple specific tricks that may help you along those lines. So these sort of 2D views are good. What's going to happen here is as you go through and place these things on sheets, you know, the, everything will stay coordinated. They're going to look pretty good. Okay. You might remember back over in 3D land, we had things that looked like this. Looked like that. Okay, and we're doing pretty good. Okay. If we wanted to go through and actually have some details that really match those 2D details, would have them be 3D details. Okay. Here's how you can do that. Let me go through, I'm going to take that and I'm going to create a new 3D view. Just duplicate that existing one. I'm going to just rename that, I'm going to call it just 3D detail. So here's the deal. If I have a view, like a 3D view, that I would like to make into a detail, what I can do is actually just take this view cube and there's a really great thing you can do here where you can orient it to one of the other views. So if I say orient it to for example, that section call out, it'll zoom it in so in 2D as a flat view, that'll look exactly like it looked over in the 2D view. Okay, but it really is a 3D view. So I can orbit that around and get to exactly what I want. Okay, so pretty good in terms of taking a 2D view and making it a 3D view very, very quickly. Let's just try that. I think it's going to work actually in this view too. Let's try it there. Although this is going a little off script. We'll see how this works. Section view. Oh, this will be interesting in terms of where the orbit works. I think it'll actually work. It's interesting. It doesn't do as good a job with the, yeah, it doesn't do as good a job with the section box in terms of doing that. I could go ahead and clean up the section box. Now I say maybe this one was better. Okay, just doing it that way. Okay, if you have a view like this, a, two, a 3D view, and you would like it to sort of be a 3D detail, let me give you sort of one very important thing you need to do before you start adding a lot of annotations to it. Because you ultimately want to create views like this and render these things and uh, put them on your boards. Because again, this is going to render just fine. Just, can I interrupt for a second? Please. This is actually uh, ideal detail for you guys because it shows the slab to all condition, shows sill shows head and a jet, right? If you look at this just quickly, this is your slab dual condition, a sill condition, head, window head, and a jet, right? You have all the conditions you need, pretty much. So, okay. so, so let's talk about how you can sort of like adapt this and kind of make it even a little bit better in terms of what you want. What? Question? One thing you may want to do, if you want to start annotating this view, watch out for this. If you go through and put text on here, and I go through and put some sort of text, and I say, oh, this is the brick. Not very pretty, but it'll sort of work. <laughs> okay. If you go through and orbit this now, something weird happens because 
this is a funny thing. It's hard to basically put 2D annotations on a 3D view. So before you start annotating these, if you really like this view, I'm going to recommend you do one thing before you do that. And it's right down in here. There's this notion of locking the view. If you lock the view, okay, what's that doing? That's just saving the camera position in place so that it can't accidentally be tweaked. Once you've put it in place, okay, now you can go through and do what you're used to. Can I get, can I get the end of it? Yeah, can I? Can you create the plane, the construction plane? Oh, yes, yes. Actually, let's do it. That'll actually work. So let's, um, if I set a construction, a pick a plane, and then just do it, just to the box. Yes. Let's see if I can get to it. I guess you change. No, I know exactly what you're doing. And then you change your box, you will still have. Yeah. I'm not sure if I can get to that anymore. I wonder if it said I've locked it already. I could definitely do it relative to sort of the wall elements, but I don't know if I can get it to the box. I was just thinking about it in terms of doing the dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We'll play with that. Because if it's there. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, 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 exactly. We got a little diversion to do over there. But in terms of sort of like improving this view, once you've locked it in place, let's go ahead and now when I annotate. We can add our annotations to it, whatever it is we want to do over there. Okay, now this view isn't though 100% kind of oh, accurate towards what we want. Well, it's never 100%, but let's kind of make it a little bit better. In particular, let me warn you about this. Okay, wooden floors and stuff like that, they're going to tend to look okay. If you put the sort of uh, joists inside the floors, they'll show up nicely in the section view. Everything will be fine. Um, this lightweight metal deck, a lightweight concrete on metal deck, is one that's sort of particularly problematic, only in that it's not modeled really accurately in terms of what's going on right now. In that it looks really good in the section view. They sort of do a little uh, kind of like a fix to it to make it look good in this view. But if you go back to that 3D view, it doesn't look so good. Okay, and Even if I go through and orbit this around, <laughs> I'm locked. <laughs> Okay, it's just flat on the bottom. So what do you do about that? Let's talk about that. Turns out if you want to go ahead and fix that, and you probably will, if you have a lightweight concrete thing and you really want to make that look good, I need to give you a special little part that we've created just to go ahead and fix this. Okay, and I'll load that thing in there and show you how it works. Let me uh, go into loading. What we're going to do, and this sort of gets into sort of how we can start changing and customizing things to make things a little bit better for what we need. If I say insert and I'm going to load, I just happen to have created, let's see if I can find it there. It's not in the main library, it's in my documents. Let me find it there. Documents. And I keep a big library of these things out there available to you to kind of do things like this. Okay, here's the deal. I have created a special little part. In fact, just so you sort of even know what it looks like, it looks like this. Let me go to the front view. It's just basically a cutout that has the shape of the little waffly metal deck and a piece of metal to kind of close up that little shape. So this is really basically like a void that I can apply to to kind of make the cutout, to make the concrete actually follow that profile. So how you actually use that is if I come back over to the other view, Oh, project two, and let me go to say the floor plan on level two. There I've got my steel, that's all looking good. If I go through and take this guy, which is something like NGIT uh, something or other, steel deck with ridges, and I bring it in, Let's see if I can bring it in. I'm trying to, but it's not wanting to cooperate. And I'll think about why there, oh there it is. Okay. Here it is as a single piece. Hang on, let me go to wireframe so we can actually see it. It's a piece that can be stretched. Let me kind of stretch it through the section. Okay, I have it defined in kind of a funny way. But what it does is in the section view, can I see it there? Let me go to the 3D view, see if you can see it there.
I'll think about why I'm not seeing it here in just a second. Is it over there? Oh, okay. So we're, we're just seeing it in the in the first floor plan, or no? In the 3D view? Is it? Oh, there it is. Jeez, Louise. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> see? Half the time, it's just that you don't see it. Okay, so there it is. Am I not seeing it just because I'm not cutting in the right section? No, because not for the section. Hmm? You're cutting on the section. Ah. Oh, okay. Well, let's... Hmm. So let me see if I can go ahead and fix this. If I say a line, and I'll do this, and I'll stretch it over to here. I just happen to have that in a perfectly bad spot. Let me lock it there. Let me do the same thing over here. I'll align this to this side. Yeah. Well, hmm, I gotta sort of redefine that object a little bit better, be a little smarter about doing that. Now the question is, oh, you're right. You have section vertical. Yes, correct. Thank you. There's something that happens when you stand up here where your brain turns off. Okay, so this is gonna start showing up in the section box. Okay, so let's go back to there. And what we need to do, because there it is looking a little better in terms of being the red steel and the kind of cut within there, is go through and actually just do an array on it. Again, I can array this thing around. I'm going to go ahead and just sort of pull from here to there to be the offset distance. I'm going to say there's going to be 50 of them, whatever it is, to go ahead and make that deck. And why didn't it do it? Let's come back over here. Yeah, exactly. I heard that. <laughs> Maybe I should be a little more modest as I do this. Huh? Looks like it did okay or something, right? Let's take a look. And you thought it couldn't be done. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that's a little bit messy in terms of what's going on, but that same basic principle, and I'll finish up with this, is going to serve us in a lot of different ways. Yes? What? Oh, yes, yes, I'll show you that. Oh, no worries. Exactly. Well, we're full of little tricks. Other little things kind of along the same principle. It's like there's this whole notion about the beam. If you need to go ahead and show the beam having fireproofing around it or something like that, go ahead and we'll go back and edit the beam part and actually add the fireproofing to the beam and kind of bring it back in that way. There's a lot of ways to do this, but whenever you can go ahead and use something to sort of generate geometry for you, okay, go ahead and do it in there. As you get to go further with all this, there's going to be a lot of questions that come up and really ask, and we'll go ahead and teach you some tricks for doing this. Okay, show like Yes. Okay. Let's go ahead and we're going to do sort of one other piece of it. We're going to do a little exploded view of the wall because that's actually sort of something. I'm not going to do it to this detail. I'm going to do it to a different one, part of it, so that you can actually sort of see it a little bit better. We'll come over here, and what I'll do is I'll cut a little section right here. Okay. And again, we'll turn that up again. I'll rotate it around a little, and we'll take a look at it. Okay, if you want to go through and start having nice views, oops, okay, there's that. Let me go back to my 3D view. And orient it to the view, I think it was called call out two. Oh, section three. There it is. Here's the deal. 
As we're working with our different elements, often then we think of that wall as being one big old chunk that has all the different layers and pieces in it together. That's great when we're designing things. As we're detailing, though, you'd like to actually be able to break it apart into separate pieces and be able to see those layers a little bit independently. And here's how you do that, just to kind of finish up. If you take that wall and do something up here called creating parts, it'll take that wall and actually break it into the individual layers. Actually, let me do that again. It's giving me a little complaining, but uh, I'm going to say okay. What we do as individual layers is I can start to separate them out a little bit. And once I start to separate them out a little bit, I can put shape handles on any individual piece. Okay. And I can actually start pulling back different layers of the wall. So if I want to, for example, go ahead and expose the brick right there and go ahead and take a look at the next layer underneath it, which is like the uh, insulation layer and whatever the layer is beneath it. We can start basically separating out the different layers of the wall and kind of exposing all those things so you can really start calling them all out independently. And then we can start tagging them and sort of say, this is the brick layer, this is insulation. You can really create some nice exploded cutaways. In fact, a better way to do it would probably be from the top part over here. Let me pull that one down, pull that one down. I'll add the shape handles here, pull that one down and kind of keep on going. So we can start exposing those all and calling out those different layers and really sort of showing people quite explicitly what's happening inside there. Okay, now to finish today, and I'll let you go in just a second, there is so much stuff that went by whoosh, in like the last little bit that like you're probably wondering like, you know, how you're gonna hold all this stuff in. And there is gonna be a recording of all this stuff and we're having the workshop later this afternoon. But if you'd like to go ahead and play around with some of this on your own and just practice, there's actually a great resource out there on uh, the Autodesk site called bimcurriculum.autodesk.com. It's something I created with the Stanford students a couple of years ago. We just really tried to say, take everything that I do in class and put it into a series of video tutorials. And in particularly, of interest to you might be Unit 2, Lesson 4, which is all about detailed design and construction documents. That's all about how to do the callouts and the 2D views and make those things. So it's let me pull that URL down so you can actually see it. So bimcurriculum.audience.com. So if you go to Unit 2, Lesson 4, that has a lot, a lot about how you create these construction views. Another lesson that may be very useful to you. Oops, hang on, not that. Oh, looks like I'm off the internet now. Don't fail me now. Way down in, let's see if I can get to it. Not enough screen space. If you go on down there into Unit 7, Lesson 1, there's another really good one there for you. Actually, you can't see it down the bottom here. That's funny. <laughs> Modeling for construction. That talks a lot about steel, concrete, and how you raise and lower the beams, and how you break things into these 3D parts so you can actually make these little exploded 3D views. Okay. There's also sort of a good session in here about just modeling structural elements. So there's a lot of different little things out there, but I'd sort of look at Unit 2, Lesson 4. That's probably one of the best ones. And then under Unit 7, Lesson 1, of course, I'm not connected to the Internet anymore. There's something all about just 3D parts and breaking it up that way. So hopefully that'll be enough to get you started, and that'll get you going. Thank you. Okay. Well, hang on, answering questions. Yes.